So obesity therapy. You know, it's gonna be a shame to really, you know, you guys just had pizza, it's a shame to really talk about it. <laughs> but so let's start anyways. So I'm just kidding. But so, of course, I'm Aaron. The very first question I wanted to present today is, is it possible to lose weight while sitting on the couch? It's an interesting question. I mean, who wouldn't want to lose weight while sitting on the couch? Can I get a, can I get a cheers or something? Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, so, I mean, but so often, we have the intention to exercise. We want to do our 5K. But, you know, the temptation comes calling to sit on the couch. I mean, it's a really comfy couch, and we fall for it quite often. But I think it's about time that we make this couch work for us, you know? So, uh, so today I'm going to be presenting about a pharmaceutical approach to treating obesity itself, a novel approach that my institute that I currently work at um, has developed. So, just what is obesity in the first place? Well, there's a formal definition, and this really centers around BMI. This stands for Body Mass Index. BMI is just simply calculated by your weight divided by your height squared, and if your value is over 25 or above, you're generally considered overweight or obese. However, for this presentation, let's keep it quite a bit more simple. Just obesity is a medical condition that occurs when a person carries excess weight or body fat, which affects their health. Next, I want to show you some exciting results that um, occurred at my institute, and I think you guys will like them too. A fat mouse. <laughs> Everybody loves a fat mouse. So uh, even though it's just a cartoon, the real deal is no less cute. <laughs> so this is what we're working with. This colorful orchestra of circles up here, we could call this a compound. The compound here could be also seen as a medicine or a treatment, even though it's not technically accurate, but we can see it in this way. But here I'll just call it compound from here. So we gave this compound to our large mice. And do you know what we saw? In 26 days, in just 20, so less than a month, we saw a 30% decrease in body weight. On the y-axis here, which is on the left, is the body weight loss in percentage. The blue line represents the mice that were given this compound, and the black line represents the mice that were not given this compound. In that same 26-day period, there was a greater than a 50% reduction in body fat mass, let alone. And I know you guys really won't believe me when I say this, I mean, but all of this was accomplished without any change in physical activity. So the mice that were given this compound performed the same amount of physical activity as the mice that were not given this compound. So now that initial question of, is it possible to lose weight while sitting on the couch? It doesn't seem so far off now, does it? And so this compound, this is the center of my presentation. This is what we created at this institute. Um, and this compound basically is comprised of a couple different hormones, which I'll go over. But what a hormone is, is basically a chemical that is secreted into the blood or into the body in response to a certain stimuli. And with this compound, we are, we are basically using nature's own toolbox by using naturally occurring hormones to treat obesity. And so before I, or to basically bring it to how we got to this compound and how we got to these results, there's quite a bit of work that had to be done. And so I basically will say, bring in the background of how we got to this point. And so hopefully you guys can understand the background and how we moved up to it. So our body has a relationship with energy. We have our little energy meter here. E is for empty, F is for full. Our energy status really determines how much we can do, what we can, how we grow, how we rest, and how we feel. But, sorry, what are the components that actually make up this relationship with energy? The first component that makes up this relationship with energy is energy expenditure. This is basically seen as your standard exercise, where you have to use your energy to be able to move your arms, to move your legs, so then you can get to where you need to do, to perform the amount of work you need to do. So your energy meter is just going to decrease. The second component of our relationship with energy is energy intake. And this is as simple as eating dinner. When we eat dinner, we break down nutrients and we immediately make available energy to our bodies so we can do further work. 
and then we have this increase in energy. So this seems pretty straightforward, right? We have our exercise, which leads to a decrease in energy, our eating, which leads to an increase in energy, and this seems pretty sound, right? Well, it's a little bit more difficult than that, actually. So the real way this occurs is that there are hormones that are elicited from physical ex exercise or from eating. The amount of energy that we burn or the amount of energy that we gain is largely dependent on the availability of these hormones. And like I said, hormones are stimulated, secreted in response to certain stimuli. So whether it be exercise or whether it be running, these res hormonal responses occur, and then these are the things that are responsible for our energy expenditure and energy intake. But so how does our hormones actually influence our energy status during exercise? So when we exercise, you know, we have this loss in energy, we start to feel tired, we start to lose power. And the reason because of this is we have low blood sugar, and more precisely, and more importantly, low energy availability. Ah, oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, but as we lose energy, there's kind of like a danger zone, a, uh, an area that you don't want to decrease your energy into. Because we use energy for everything, for breathing, for thinking, for keeping our heartbeat. And so, in order for our body to be able to maintain the energy status so that we can keep exercising without dying, um, we have a change in hormones that allow us to keep going. And so, in response to this decrease in energy, our body stimulates the release of certain hormones, and this hormone can be called glucagon. What does glucagon do? Well, it increases energy availability and increases blood glucose, or blood sugar. And this leads to an elevation back to your energy. So you can keep exercising while still breathing and still um, keeping your heart beating. But how does it do this? It does this by breaking down fat itself. And everyone loves that. This is what everyone kind of looks for in exercise, breaking down fat. And so this is how it occurs. It's keeping you alive. It's a response to keeping you alive. And also it increases natural sugar. Oppositely, when you're eating food, this kind of, it's a very similar response, but in the opposite direction. We have this increase in energy availability, but however, our body does not like to have a surplus energy. It does not like to have extra energy or be overloaded with it. So there is another danger zone, in a sense. And it's kind of like when you're filling up your gas tank or your fuel tank for your car. There's these little breaks on the pump, where when you're pumping and the tank gets full, it stops automatically so it doesn't flow over and you're standing in a puddle and nobody wants that. Your brain, basically, or your body, has the same concept involved here. It recognizes that your energy needs have been met, and it needs to tell the person, the user, when they're eating, to stop eating. And this is simply done by making you feel full. But how does that feeling of full actually occur? Well, again, you might have guessed it, it's a change in hormones. And so in this case, as you're eating, as you're increasing your energy status in your body, realizes something's going on, it's going to increase something called GLP-1. This is another hormone. And what does it do? It signals this fullness feeling. It starts, it basically press, presses the start button on fullness, which then slows down our energy intake so we do not go into this danger zone. But how does it do this? It signals directly to the brain itself. It's not taking any other roundabout ways, it goes directly to the brain. So we have two molecules here. We have glucagon, which breaks down fat for energy, as, as well as GLP-1, which signals fullness to the brain. Not a bad duo to have when we're talking about losing waves. I would like now to go on a quick excursion with you, maybe some quick bio, biochemistry in a way, to show you how these things occur. So we have glucagon here. This is the fat cell. This is the unfortunate fellows that lay around your stomach and don't give you that beach body. And they're kind of a nuisance. But this is, this is them right here. And inside this square is the inside of the adipose tissue or the fat tissue. Um, inside the cell. When we eat and when we have energy surplus, we tend to accumulate fat. And that's what's happening here. We have, we're eating. There's dietary fats building in this um, fat tissue. And they end up forming a thing called a lipid droplet. This is what gives this fat tissue its standard color. Additionally, within the cell, we also have mitochondria. And this is where energy production happens. This is the powerhouse of the cell, if you will. 
These, in order to produce energy, it can also use fat, which is present in the lipid chocolate. So when we exercise, there's this increase in glucagon. This, this glucagon is going to bind to this receptor or get caught by this receptor on the cell, and it's going to cause a breakdown of the lipid chocolate, which will then be shuttled into the mitochondria for energy production, thus bringing up our energy status again as we're exercising. So this is occurring during exercise. For GLP-1, it's a little bit different. So this is a little near anatomy. When we have a brain, in the, specifically in the hypothalamus, so the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, you don't really need to know that. But um, there is three sets of neurons. And it's quite easy, so don't worry. But so we have Tom C neurons here, which, re which represent satiety, or being feeling full. We also have AGRP neurons, which represent hunger. And then we have them both signaling to a control center, where basically, if they say, feel full, they send it to the control center, and the control center sends it out to the rest of the body. But so as we eat, we have this increase in GLP-1. GLP-1 then binds to the receptor on the POMC neurons. From here, the POMC neuron is activated, and it will signal to both the AGRP and the MC4R neurons. It basically reduces hunger by inhibiting it, but also tells the control center to make the rest of the body feel full. And so this is how GLP-1 is at working, which then is able to stop our um, energy increases as we're eating and not allow us to assume, consume too much. So we have our hormones here, glucagon and GLP-1, just break down fat and signal full to the brain. What we're doing and what our strategy was at this pharmaceutical development is to bring together the best of both worlds. We have exercise, losing fat. We have eating, feeling full. We bring it together into one compound, which is what we wanted to do. And so essentially, we broke apart these two, these two hormones and brought them together into one. And so now we have GLP-1 glucagon as a single molecule, which now acts as dual agonist for breaking down energy from fat and as well as signaling to the brain to feel full all in one single molecule. And so essentially we're bringing together the best of both worlds. Now, have people been using this? They have. From articles and from research papers, we see that GLP-1 and glucagon receptor dual agonists have been promising agents for weight loss. They have been shown to reverse obesity in mice. And do they do it in humans? Of course. Um, it has the potential, GLP-1, glucagon, dual agonists have the potential to deliver clinically meaningful reductions in blood glucose and body weight, both the obese and overweight patient. So this is quite promising, and due to this promise, nearly every pharmaceutical, large pharmaceutical company out there that is in obesity and diabetes research has been investing in these new compounds, these GLP-1 and glucagon compounds. So I, as a side note before I finish on this last part, I kind of want you guys to know that you heard it here first. I mean, so these are, <laughs> yeah. so these are compounds that are not out yet. They're still in the development phase. They're still in clinical phase one and phase two, but um, but they will be out, and they have lots of promise. And so I want you guys to know about it. When you go home, you have this on your radar. But what? Why? Why would we do this? What is the purpose of trying to treat obesity in the first place? Um, and this is because simply obesity is a gateway drug. Or a gateway disease. <laughs> uh, a gateway disease, sorry, sorry. But I guess, I guess you get my point. Um, so, I mean, obesity is one of the leading causes of death nationwide. It, the reason for this is because there's many comorbidities or other diseases that come along with obesity. And this could be heart disease, or high blood pressure, diabetes among many others. So once you get obese, uh, once you get obese or you start getting overweight, you're more prone to developing these pathological diseases that could end up harming you later on. So this is one of the driving forces as to why we wanted to develop this um, compound. Um, also, and I think this is the last slide right here, but to also bring it home to understand why or make it um, understandable in the brain as not such an abstract con uh, concept, but something that's here, happening right now, is that there are currently 7.4 billion people in the world. And of those, 39% are overweight. This is 3 billion people. That's 3 billion people, man. It's crazy. And of that, 
13% of the global population of 7.4 billion people, 13% are obese. And so, along with that, there are certain preventable costs that uh, could be prevented. So, when I say global economic burden, I mean preventable cost. And so we see smoking, a preventable cost, is estimated to cost $3 trillion worldwide, as well as armed conflict. But then we see obesity causing the same thing. So basically what I want to just say right here is just, this is why we're developing it. Not just for, not just for our own selves, not just for the pharmaceutical companies, but for the population in general, for the 13% of the global population that's suffering from this and the comorbidities that come from it. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, yeah, I guess now the moment we can get it, uh, we can go to your left and get ourselves quickly ready for the bikini season. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, <laughs> each party, yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, your question, guys. We still have. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the insights. And actually, I actually have two questions. Uh, the first one is by Anna. Ah, uh, good question. How oh, with the Panama Canal and like I think it has a booming industry um, and I think it's pretty lucrative to start a new business in, so that's what I do. Alright. So. And second one, and do you think the drug can be used sustainably, especially does it go together well with exercise programs? Exactly. I think that's something I should have probably brought up in this presentation. But so I mean generally speaking, this is kind of an exaggeration as to what it can do because losing weight on the couch is something we all want. But it's technically possible with this. But with any actual real obesity treatment, a change in lifestyle, proper eating, exercise, are all things that need to be accompanied with this compound in order to get optimal results. So. Thank you. Okay, there is one question over there. Thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting. Here. Ah, sorry. Okay. Um, one question though. Isn't there a possibility that people get addicted to it and that kind of like supports the what is it called? Myrosol? Anorexia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, so basically, uh, what he asked just now is um, is there an addiction potential for this, uh, this drug? And can it lead to problems such as anorexia uh, or just a, a persistent stoppage of eating? And uh, so, I, also, this is something I kind of took out of this presentation earlier because it kind of made it too long. But the history of drug development has actually started from drugs like amphetamines and different kind of weight loss compounds that not only make you lose weight, but also have addictive potential because they work on certain neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, however, these, this compound doesn't necessarily work in the same way. Um, so these are just naturally occurring hormones that, um, that cause, ah, uh, it's, you don't get the same feeling or the same, like, uh, the same reward system response that you would from these previous um, compounds. And so I would say that the addiction potential is minimum. However, if you find, I mean, I'm sure there's situations where um, it could be addictive, but I don't think it would be anything along the lines of traditional um, weight loss. Okay, thank you. One more question here. Uh, when can I buy, uh, like, how long do you do Yeah, so actually, it's <laughs> funny. So it's, it's actually, it's not so far away actually. So um, this is just one of the compounds. So this is, um, the GLP-1 glucagon is one version of this. Um, my institute actually developed the concept of it about five years ago. And right now it's now in um, development phase one and phase two, which means it's halfway there, more or less. But right now it's starting to get more notoriety through news articles, through more people talking about it, as well as um, conferences. And so I would say within just a, a, a rough guess, don't poke me down. Something like for another five years, maybe it'll be here, so. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe some more. Okay, we have time for two more last questions. Okay, we're here. Hi. Um, forgive me if I sound rude when I ask that question. But since this all spoke about hormones, um, when you tested it, did you take into consideration how hormones in general is this time 39 days affect a woman's menstrual cycle and how that usually breaks habit with? Just, you know, appetite and all those things considering the uptake and endometriosis and PCOD and all that also. Right. So you're saying, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, of course. Yeah, so you're basically saying, are there any, like, uh, negative interactions that would I mean, Did you 
was that considered during the research and how that, that 29 day cycle is also pretty much the same as the female menstrual cycle, which has high and low hormones and how that these hormones would mm -hmm. Yeah, so so there's different uh, realms of hormones. There's kind of like these um, sexual hormones, but then there's also um, diet, dietary hormones. For example, GLP-1 is stimulated just from the presence of food in the stomach um, or in the intestine. And the same with glucagon, it's only expressed when there's low blood sugar or uh, you exercise or something like this. Um, so um, having these elevated isn't necessarily a uh, a causal uh, attribute to anything that, like you're saying for these um, menstrual cycles. But um, also it's actually taken into consideration as we kind of pick the right receptors. Because there's certain receptors that do influence this and so we don't use those compounds, but this was um, in consideration when we developed it. All right, we have one last question, please. Hi, interesting presentation. I just want to ask what about the effect of this compound um, on other compounds and also how uh, would this be messed with a natural way of producing the government by the body because if you need to use the tissue, would your body just be used to that and then the natural is replacing this line? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So so the first question is um is uh, can you can you repeat the first question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Basically uh what is the interaction with other hormones? Mm -hmm. Like would somehow um, you know, break it down or something? Alright, okay. And then the second question is this explosive the natural will, will be this combined mess in the natural um, production of such Right. So, um, so the natural production, I can answer both these questions kind of in the same answer. So the, um, the natural hormones that are produced actually are generated super quickly. They're, they're made it within seconds. And so the amount that just make it to the brain or to the certain tissue um, is relatively little. Um, so when we when this compound was created, it seems kind of adjusted it so that it's not degraded so quickly. Um, but however, in terms of it interacting with other hormones, uh, we don't necessarily see anything of that nature directly. But when you go in an indirect kind of viewpoint, it's possible, especially like this kind of down regulation that you were asking about, like does it eventually down regulate something and we don't know yet. But it seems to be working and it seems to have long term benefits. So. All right, and then now that there is something. Ah, yeah, can I ask you guys a question real quick? Uh, can I take a picture like, uh, with all you guys? In the back? Is that okay? Cool. <laughs> 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 Thank you guys. <laughs>